communication systems, sensing systems, and by sensing systems, I mean lots of things, but and specifically I'll be talking about radar. Um, so for very good reasons, uh, historically communication systems, radar systems, other sensing systems were stovepiped. They were stovepiped in terms of spectrum, they were stovepiped in terms of their processing chains. Uh, they were just kept far away from each other, right? And the people who worked on communication systems wouldn't talk to people who worked on radar systems. Um, and, and these were all for good reasons because it was actually hard to get the things to work at all. Uh, but, but things are changing. So they're changing from multiple directions. In terms of our finite uh, allocations, our finite resources in terms of spectrum, uh, there are lots of now pressures to, to reuse that spectrum as efficiently, efficiently as possible. And on the other side, technology has evolved up to the point where we can actually make some progress. Now, I, um, at the IEEE radar conference a couple weeks ago, I gave a four-hour tutorial on this topic. So we have time, Peter, right? Is that, yeah, okay. I <laughs> love make sure. you, man. So, uh, so quickly, I'm going to go over a, a, a short introduction of what I mean by RF convergence. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple specific examples, which are kind of fun, and both for both of which I use MATLAB, so um, make people happy here as well. And one is a, a, a multi-user communication system that performs multi-static synthetic aperture radar. Um, some of you will know what that means. Uh, and the second one is a joint radar return and communications multi-access receiver. So I'll, I'll walk through these as we go along. Uh, thinking about what, what I mean by uh, the RF convergence, um, and I usually drop the communications and sensing part of it. So I want to figure out how to use the RF spectrum uh, just better, right? So we're going to reuse the same RF energy for multiple functions. We're going to reuse each node, which historically would have been either a radar receiver or a communication receiver, to perform multiple functions simultaneously. So now all of a sudden we have all these resources that we never had before. So potentially we can gain a lot more information about the entire environment by doing this. And as I said a moment ago, this was enabled, or this has been enabled, by just really significant advances in the RF technology and in the computational technology. So I, I, I talk about this. One of the things that we're interested in the center that I run is, is um, how, do we do, how do we do all these sorts of things? But the other part is the computational aspects. And over the last several years, heterogeneous processors have really made uh, made lots of flexible systems viable, where historically we would have had to put everything on an ASIC, now the idea of putting this stuff on an energy efficient uh, uh, heterogeneous processor is, is, is really becoming viable. So and that's going to, that's going to uh, as time goes on, even get more so. Um, and, and I think an important concept here is uh, I'm not trying to operate a radar in the presence of a comm system. I'm not trying to operate a comm system in the presence of a radar and try not to degrade things too much. I actually want to improve performance of everything. Right? By, by allowing everybody to have access to more capabilities, I want to improve everything. So it's easy to understand how you might consider this problem for military applications. Uh, for instance, it's, uh, that's the folks who are funding this research right now are primarily uh, DOD. Um, so you know, I have communication systems, I have radar systems, and potentially I can reuse all the RF energy to perform multiple functions simultaneously. Everything theoretically gets better. Um, of course, you know, now we're all worried about automotive, automotive systems. And you know, the, the, the car that I'm driving has a radar on it. And pretty soon, they'll all be talking to each other. It's amusing that we have these essentially line of sight comms links we want to implement. And we have um, you know, RF radar systems. And we don't reuse the same transceivers. It makes no sense, right? We could reuse the, the same infrastructure and get much better performance on both systems, potentially. And probably something that uh, only a small fraction of you are aware of, uh, radars are going to become free. So uh, you know, we, we are sort of used to thinking of large scale radars, big things, things with big dishes. right? But, but very quickly, very small scale radars are going to become the dominant kind of radars. And an example is the Soli radar, which was produced by Google. This is a 60 gigahertz radar. It's a center frequency. It has several gigahertz of bandwidth. And the intention for making this radar is actually estimating hand gestures. So it turns out, you know, we interact with our phones, for instance, by doing this really clumsy right, swiping and stuff, which is kind of intuitive, but it's not what we evolved to do, right? We're really good at precision control like this, or like this, or like this. We're, this is not a comfortable manipulation. And so if you can figure out how to actually finally 
estimate the position of your fingers as you do this, which you probably can't even see me moving them, right? Um, that would be better. And, and so uh, the folks at Google have recognized this, and they built a radar around this particular application. The range of the radar is sort of this-ish, right? So actually, um, Lina, Lina Karam and I have a, have a project with uh, Google where we're, we're playing with the, the radar. Um, and, and the other thing about this is that uh, the IC technology has just gotten to the point where you can put all this stuff in CMOS. I can put all the transceivers, and I can put the processing, and I can put everything I need for the entire radar system on a chip. And the chip is now going to become free. So I suspect you're going to see these tiny little radars everywhere. If you then couple this with a desire to go to millimeter wave for 5G communications, well, if I'm going to put these, res these transceivers on my phone so I could do a millimeter wave, why don't I reuse the same front end to actually do radar simultaneously, right? And if I'm going to do it for hand gesture, why don't I do it for understanding what's going on in an entire room? Why don't, why don't I understand it for situational awareness? My phone becomes something which is much smarter. And, you know, sure, I could use a camera, but the radar is going to become cheaper than the camera, and the radar can see, you know, through my clothes, right? So, um, which, by the way, I've tested. I threw a jacket over the Soli radar, and, yeah. All right, so uh, an important thing to point out, and this is true almost universally, uh, whenever you talk about a particular topic, you have, a, you have some topology in mind, and everyone else has some other topology in mind. And when you read a paper, you spend the, you spend the first two pages trying to figure out that you're wrong. They actually meant a different problem. This is, this is really true in, in RF convergence, and I just threw up a, a set of toy topologies here. You know, it, it, it means lots of different things. So when people talk about simultaneous uh, radar and communications, sometimes they mean I'm going to reuse the waveform, and the waveform is going to be used for both uh, a communications waveform and a radar elimination waveform. Uh, sometimes they mean it's a multi-access receiver. That's the one in the center there. Sometimes it means you know the radar is a uh, as a radar, radar is a relay, so I can use my radar uh, receiver and transmitter as also as a base station. All right. So you can imagine I can do. Uh, local area uh, surveillance with a, with a radar, but at the same time, I'm using it as a base station for my communications. So I get to reuse all the, the hardware and the advantage position in my infrastructure for a purpose that wasn't intended by reusing those waveforms. All right, so let's start off by thinking about this particular problem. I have multiple sources that are trying to communicate to my receiver, right? So they're transmitting a communication signal. I'm going to reuse that communication uh, signal from both of those transmitters to try to figure out what's going on um, in the environment. So I'm doing both, this, these waveforms are used both for communications and for uh, illumination for uh, the, you know, the channel estimation, but I'm going to interpret this channel, all right? So we're going to talk about the, the joint communications radar waveform, uh, multi-user detection, and multi-static synthetic aperture radar, which is something of a mouthful. So let's set up the problem. I have multiple illumination sources. They're moving. So one of my students drew by hand this cute little jet. So that's, uh, I reuse it just because, because I thought he did a nice job. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a wide band illumination waveform, and it's also a wide band communication waveform. I have a second one illuminating the same region simultaneously. All right? And they're moving, so I can use them for a synthetic aperture, to build a synthetic aperture. All right? And then I have a receiver. The receiver has to disentangle everything that's going on, has to figure out how to decode these signals. It, it sees multiple signals coming in. It has to decode both of them. And it can use all this information that it decoded to form an image, a synthetic aperture image of the region, from multiple aspect, multiple aspect angles. So it's a, that's why it's a multi-static um, synthetic aperture radar. All right, so we have a few problems. We need to develop a, a, a simulation to, to do all this, because I don't have the resources to go buy a bunch of jets and go fly them. Um, although we, uh, we do have some small UAVs, and this is on my list of things to do. Um, so we need to come up with a, a, a simulation. And then we need, in the simulation, we need to have a channel model for what the scattering is for, for our, our objects on the ground. All right, so um, once again, given finite resources, uh, we played a trick to do this. So we're not the first to do this, but the idea is I need to incorporate all the spatial correlations for my scattering model. So one nice way to do that is just to take some, some imagery, some satellite imagery, and that will give you some spatial correlation. Now, it's not the right radar cross-section. It's all wrong. 
but at least it has the right sort of spatial characteristics. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that, and then I can, I can split this into to cells that make sense for, for radar processing, so I don't have to have it at full resolution of the pixels. So I downsample it a little bit. I create a, um, a, a reflectivity map, and what I, what I do is I take the, um, the, the histogram, the distribution of the intensities of the image, and remap it to the intensities that we expect from bistatic cross-sections for, for synthetic aperture radar, so we can go through that. So we remap the distributions, and that gives us this reflectivity map. So now the object has, so, or, our, or our channel simulation, has sort of the right properties in terms of uh, the spatial distribution or the spatial correlation. It has sort of the right properties in terms of the distribution of cross-sections. All right, so we can take that. And then we um, run that through uh, the radar simulation. The radar simulation has uh, beam patterns, and, so it, and, and then the, uh, the, the platforms move, and so we take all this stuff into account, and we can, we can figure out what's going on now. All right, now I need to take a step back and, and mention a little bit of information theory. Um, lots of you took classes in information theory. Some fraction of you may even teach classes that involve information theory uh, from time to time. Uh, and if you didn't, I'm sorry right now because this will just be really just completely opaque. But in any case, so you remember, you know, Shannon's limit, right? So if I have multiple users that are transmitting a signal to a particular receiver, that's the multi-access problem. Well, we know that there must be bounded fundamentally by the Shannon limit of a particular transmitter to the receiver. So the, the P1 you see there, that's the transmit power and noise normalized units. And the, uh, the A1 is the, uh, the complex attenuation, or the, I'm gonna square it, that's the, basically the, the, the attenuation, right? So A, uh, A squared P is basically the SNR. So we know that the rate for one particular user is bounded by that. We know the second user is also round, bounded by its, basically, Shannon limit. Turns out, and this may not be as obvious, the sum rate is bounded by the sum SNR. All right, it's bound by the, uh, the capacity given by the sum SNR. So I now have uh, these three, three equations. I can, uh, I can make some observations about this. There are some points of intersection. I can solve for those points of intersection. And I can take this and I can construct these, these, these bounds, right? So the pentagram that you see there is the multi-access bound for two communication systems coming into one receiver, all right? And this is a fundamental, it's achievable, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's also the, 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 the fundamental bound. You can't do any better than this. So that pentagram, you see the, the, the two, one, three, uh, four along there, that is the achievable bound. It's bounded by the capacity of one user and the capacity of the other user and the, capacity, the sum capacity for the, the two users in the SNR. We're going to use this. We're going to actually build receivers that, that try to do this. And we do this by figuring out how to evaluate the performance or actually to achieve the performance at those vertices of one and three. We call those the excessive interference cancellation points. So we're gonna use this. All right. So we built our scattering, our scattering model we have our moving transmitters, we have a moving receiver, um, and we have a scattering model so we can produce all this stuff. All this stuff is running in MATLAB, of course. Um, we're gonna take advantage of our, our multi-access receiver and we're gonna implement successive interference cancellation. And we do that and we can scan the, uh, the rates back and forth by changing our, uh, our spreading code for either the source one or source two. And what you see is we get a real performance which is indicated by the, what we refer to as the L-plot. Um, and what you can see is we're basically achieving those, uh, those, those endpoints of the, uh, the, those vertexes. It's not as good as the ultimate capacity, but because of the losses of the error correcting code and uh, the actual processing chain, you lose a little bit. Um, but it produces that. You'll notice that it has an L, and not a, it doesn't look like a, a, a pentagon. Um, I can actually achieve that pentagon by time averaging those two vertices, so I can, back, I can, back, can get back up to that pentagon. So now we have decoded those signals, so, right, I have, I have decoded, so long as I'm in the, the red region, I've decoded both of those signals. I can now use both of those signals as uh, references to do the synthetic aperture radar processing. And uh, it's more complicated when, than what I will show, but basically I have now multiple synthetic aperture uh, radar images and I can figure out how to combine them. And when I do that, I can recover the synthetic aperture radar image. All right, so once again, this is a, a multi-static uh, multi uh, synthetic aperture radar image that was constructed with communication signals. 
multiple communication signals, all right? And actually, we can do a little bit better than this one right now, but this is what I have. Okay, next topic. Uh, joint radar return and communications multi-access uh, receiver. And it has this sort of topology. Um, in some ways, this is simpler. I have an illuminator, it illuminates the target, it returns. I have a, uh, a, a communications transmitter. Um, so the, the, the radar is basically using a traditional radar waveform, which is uh, usually a chirp, is a chirp in our, in our case. And I have a communications waveform, which is impinging upon the same receiver. I now have to figure out how to disentangle both of these signals simultaneously. All right, so I told you before about the, the, the theoretical communications multi-access receiver, and I go, well, isn't that the same thing? And the answer is no. And the reason why is when I'm doing radar, uh, when I'm trying to use a radar, it's estimating characteristics about the target, and those things do not come from a countable dictionary, and so all the theory which applies to the multiple access uh, system doesn't apply here. But I have comms on one side and radar on the other, and actually, it's, I can still probably build something that looks a little bit like this. All right, so we're gonna try to do that. We're gonna try to figure out what the theoretical performance bound is for this. Whole bunch of calculations and stuff go on, which I'm now going to sweep very quickly under the rug, because you didn't really care. Um, but I can go through, I can, I can build a system, a uh, block diagram of the processing chain, how everything works, um, and I can, can, I can construct a, uh, a rate for the estimation performance, so I'm trying to estimate the position of my target as it moves around, and it's gonna look like a comms rate. And I will just tell you this in words, we call this estimation, we call this an estimation rate, and the estimation rate is basically the average number of bits per seconds required to encode everything you really learned about the target motion from your radar, okay? So now I have communications rate along one side and the estimation rate along the other axis, and I can, I can build these, these limiting bounds of performance, which are not exactly like the Pentagon we said before, we had before, but it has a little bit of these, little bit of these characteristics. So we can, we can go ahead and do that. Um, I would like to implement this in a, a real over-the-air experiment, all right? And in order to do this, we have developed a, a, a suite of uh, Edis radios in the lab, and we're going to play a trick. Now, the idea is I have a bunch of students who are going to write really sloppy, bad code, and do it badly. And I want to get it over, in the, over the air within minutes. So what we have is we're going to emulate a real-time system, not by implementing real-time code, but by stopping time. So what we do is we have a whole suite of these, these radios. It's all controlled by GPS. And GPS basically starts and stops all the radios. So they're usually off. They're only on for a short amount of time, right? So you have a bunch of radios. They all, they all have uh, GPS uh, timing. The timing is, uh, the timing error is small compared to a microsecond. They all come up, they transfer, transmit for 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, then they stop. And this horrible MATLAB code, which the students wrote, runs, crashes, doesn't work, does the wrong thing. They realize that, they update the code, hit one button, it gets distributed amongst all the, all the radios again, and it runs again, all right? And so you can go through many, many cycles using completely different ideas, all within minutes. Okay, so here's a cartoon where I have uh, a bunch of radios and one transmit, or you know, one transmits and a bunch receive and so forth, and there's some processing which is done in the MATLAB and it figures it out and goes on. So the stop time processing, or the stop action, I call it putt-putt usually, but the stop action processing allows us to do this very quickly. Um, and it's real, we have 20-something we have radios in the lab which we can use, here you see a photo of, was it eight, 10 maybe? Uh, these are all B210s, we have X310s as well. And uh, connected to each one of these is a, a single board computer, um, an Intel Nook. It's basically half a laptop. It's a laptop without the screen. Um, so they run headless. We have one control system, which basically feeds all the control software, basically automatically distributes the MATLAB to each of these machines. And it controls the initiation and timing. So basically it goes, all right, everyone goes up. What you also see there is there's a GPS repeater. So I pipe in GPS into the lab. And so all these guys are synchronous to the GPS. So they all know when to start. They're all synchronous to GPS. They all start up within some small fraction of a microsecond. They transmit or receive what they're going to do. They stop, time stops, and we have MATLAB, this poorly written MATLAB. Basically gets to catch up, decides what the radio is going to do next. What is it going to transmit? How is it going to listen, right? And it does it again. So we can do lots of different comm systems quickly. 
And um, in this particular case, we're going to do the, uh, the simultaneous reception of a, of a radar signal and the comm signal. So to demonstrate the feasibility, what we have is you know, some of our radios up here. Uh, we have basically a multiple access uh, uh, successive interference cancellation code running on, on, on the receiver. Uh, we actually have some power control in the loop. We have a comm signal here, and what you see in the, the performance evaluation plots there is there's a, a bunch of signal there. There's a wide, there's a relatively wide band, or not super wide band, 10 or six, six or so uh, megahertz, but a, a wide band uh, communication signal, and you can sort of see a chirp marching across as well, and there's a chirp that's overlaid on top of it. But, but using the success of the interference cancellation, we go, we decode the communication signal, we then subtract that off of the, the data, and then the, the radar return basically is sitting there as if there was no comm signal, and we get the performance for the, uh, the, the radar system as if there was no comm signal, so I get to reuse that spectrum basically almost uh, perfectly. All right, so introduced the concept of RF convergence, demonstrated the MATLAB simulation of a, this sort of complicated communications and uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar system. Demonstrated, uh, I told you a little bit about the multi-access problem and some new theory that we're developing on you know, what can you do theoretically in terms of uh, RF convergence. Um, and then demonstrated uh, algorithms to implement these techniques experimentally using MATLAB and loop uh, over the air experiments 